Today we're talking about China, a country with such Islamophobic policies they're getting criticized by the Trump administration. That's like the cast of friends telling you you need a more diverse friend group. So what's going on in China? Well, it depends on who you ask, because unsurprisingly enough, if you ask a Chinese government official, you're going to get a very different answer than if you ask anybody else. Basically, China's setting up best case scenario re-education camps, worst case scenario concentration camps that are detaining approximately a million Uyghurs. Now, first off, a million people. That's a pretty easy number to just gloss over. I mean, I think after listening to the news for years, I've become desensitized to caring about any number below 20 billion. But in this case, a million people is a ton. I mean, the entire population of the city of Seattle, or the city of Denver, are 700,000 each. So if you're going to round up more than a major metropolitan city's worth of people, well, you better have a good reason. China says it's responding to what it calls Uyghur terrorism and a Uyghur separatist movement. Here's a little background. This whole issue is happening in the pretty obscure portion of China called Xinjiang a province that's right next to the part of the map that made you get a B instead of an A on your geography final. Turkmenistan? Kazakhstan? In fact, the region we're talking about today was called Uyghurstan for a while before it got its current name, China. During the late 1940s, they led an independence rebellion, but by 1950, China had control over the region. Suffice to say that eastern China and this Xinjiang Uyghur autonomous region aren't exactly holding hands and singing kumbaya. This is where the problem comes in. For many people in the Chinese public, it is not hard to see links between international terrorists and separatists, especially activists in restive Chinese minority regions like Tibet and Xinjiang, which many Chinese refer to as East Turkestan. To get personal for a second, I actually lived in China for a few months when this was the main headline. China has blamed Muslim Uyghur separatists from Xinjiang region for the knife attack that killed 33 people and left over 130 injured at a railway station in the southwestern Chinese city of Kunming late on Saturday. Now, if you live in China, you've seen reports of quite a few of these attacks. The problem is, of course, the vast, vast majority of Uyghurs are not members of an alleged terrorist organization like the Eastern Turkestan Islamic Movement, whose aim is the establishment of a fundamentalist Muslim state to be called East Turkestan and the conversion of all Chinese people to Islam. And I'm offended. What about us white people? What, are our souls chopped liver? So China, in its infinite wisdom, looked at this group and said, hmm. How can we make these guys look like the protagonists by comparison? I mean, looking at a list of Chinese separatist attacks, several hundred Chinese people have been killed in the last 10 years. But locking up and re-educating a million people? That seems like a bit of an overreaction. So again, what's the plan? Because if your main pitch to me is, hey Steven, you know what'll make us popular in this majority minority region? arresting everyone of the predominant religion of the region and trying to turn them. I would enthusiastically fire you. To understand the logic of this strategy, we have to look at the person implementing it. Chen Chuanguo has initiated unprecedented harsh policies against Uyghurs since he was appointed Communist Party chief in northwest China's Xinjiang region in August 2016. Ah yes, Chen Chuanguo current appointed leader of Xinjiang and former leader of, oh my god, really? Tibet. Yeah, this guy is a bit of a track record. Just three months after former Tibet party boss Chen Chuangguo took his new post in Xinjiang, the far western frontier is implementing new security and surveillance measures policies its Tibetan neighbors to the south are only too familiar with. Chen has clearly looked at what happened in Tibet and wants to see that repeated. So, what happened in Tibet? Well, he was appointed leader of Tibet in 2011. China is now admitting that anti-government riots that started out in Tibet have moved into other provinces. Authorities say they've also begun arresting people in connection with the violence. Beijing has imposed a ban on foreigners traveling to some areas, and tour groups are banned from Tibet. Not sure who he ticked off to get that job. This served as a pretty good practice run for his time in Xinjiang. Because in Tibet, rather than Muslims, he was in charge of pacifying Buddhists. 
which I have to imagine is a little easier. He told the cadres that social stability was their first responsibility, instructed them to live in Tibetan villages, and assigned party officials to Buddhist temples. Buddhism in Tibet, Chen said, should be adapted to socialist civilization. A major question I had when I read this was, what's a cadre? I feel like that's how Clint Eastwood play one of those in a western back in the day. Basically, it's a person who's a member of the Chinese Communist Party who's on the government payroll and doesn't work in manual labor. In 2013, one Chinese scholar criticized his strategy by saying, She's suggesting that, 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 we have to get, that they should get away from this idea of treating everything, every sign of Tibetan culture and religion as inherently a, a call for separatism, but just keep separate the political issues and the religious issues. Basically, in this period, any part of Tibetan culture that they couldn't slap a Made in China sticker on was deemed rebellious. By 2015, Chen stationed some 100,000 cadres in Tibetan villages. More than 1,700 temples had established party organizations. Between 2011 and 2016, the Tibetan government advertised for 12,313 police-related positions, more than four times as many as the preceding five years combined. So times were good if you were pursuing a career and spying on your neighbors, but otherwise not so much. This period mainly was focused on the re-education of Buddhists by the government, targeting people who had pictures of the Dalai Lama, spoke Tibetan, and practiced certain parts of the religion. And it worked really well. Meng Zhuanzhou, head of the China's security apparatus during Chen's time in Tibet, described it as a leading example for the whole country in stability maintenance. So now to today, because you have the former leader of Tibet approaching this new region with the winning strategy. Only this time, it's on steroids. Xinjiang's consistent measures are intended to promote stability, development, harmony, and at the same time strike against ethnic separatists and terrorist opposition movements according to the law. This region has all shades of veiled policies, from bans on burqas to giving babies the old Ellis Island treatment. That name is a bit too Muslim, let's stick to Chinese names here. I could go into all the regulations, but it all just goes towards one narrative. Let's make Xinjiang as Chinese as possible. This might seem like a nice place to end, but there's one final question. Why ramp up these re-education centers? I mean, you did a nice effective long game campaign in Tibet, why not just do that again? Well, China might be in a little bit of a time crunch on this one. Let me show you two maps. First, this is where the majority of violence is occurring in Xinjiang. And second, this is a map of where China plans on putting the key railroad station for their One Belt One Road plan. If you put the two together, you'll see that the key railroad station for their multi-billion dollar trade revolution is going right over the biggest separatist hotspot. So not great planning. The Urumqi Central Assembly Center works as the heart pumping blood into the arteries. Freight traveling in and out of China comes through this transportation hub every day. So who knows, there could be another more violent trade war brewing. Because you get an attack on the heart of the new Chinese import-export system and that could be very expensive. So far, Chen, the new leader of Xinjiang, has been described as effective in putting policy initiatives sole emphasis on security. The question right now is, is this fast approach going to expedite the assimilation process or isolate and anger the local population into a position of further radicalism? Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to support independent non-partisan comedy news, remember to subscribe by clicking on this floating logo to the right of my head. Or do it the old fashioned way by clicking the subscribe button below. Ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring and remember to give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.